I have taught on marriage many, many times over the years. My goal today is to give you courage. And I, my goal is as we talk about this subject together, and I know some of you are not married, some of you are single, some of you may have gone through a divorce recently or maybe a while back, I don't know. Some of you have lost your spouse. Um, I, I just, just know that I'm trying to tread lightly and lovingly, but I'm also trying to give courage. And uh, I'm also, I, I got to be honest with you because I have a bias here. I have a, a passion here. Um, I, I love marriage. I love being married. I don't love every minute of being married, but I love being married. I love my wife. We have been married over 36 years, and it has been, it has been so wonderful and so hard. And, uh, you know, there's a meme going around the Internet, you know, being married's hard, being single is hard. Choose your heart. And... Uh, but I, I love marriage. And today I'm going to look at a passage. I don't need you to agree with me. You need to know that right away, okay? You don't have to agree with me on everything I say. I'm not asking you to agree. I'm asking you to reconsider a few things. That's all I'm asking. I think if you can think about some things that maybe you can think on a different level. And so, yes, I'm going to challenge a few things. Um, but in the end, what I hope I do is I give you a vision for something amazing. Because I think every marriage has, could be amazing. And so, uh, and I know some of you may be sitting there going, I don't know. So what we'll say today is our goal isn't amazing. Our goal is better. If we could do better, that'd be good, Right. <laughs> You know, the, part, the point of this series is that what you know has gotten you to where you are. What you know has gotten you here. But is it enough to get you there? And that's the point of this series. Because this is what life is. Life is about learning. It's about meeting circumstances where what I have learned is no longer adequate to get me through. And so now I must learn something else. I may need to unlearn what I've learned, and I may need to relearn something. That's what this series is about. It's actually a continuation of our last series, which was about repentance or metanoia, which is about transformed thinking. Not just about repentance from sin, but about changing and elevating the way you think so you learn to think like Jesus and not like everyone around you. So I was going to spend a, an, a section of this introduction telling you how to be miserable in marriage. <laughs> but I think most of you got that figured out, so I'm going to move on. <clears throat> so, I'm reading out of Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, and I'm reading it out of the Passion Translation, and I'm doing it on purpose. I'm reading out of the Passion Translation because I really believe that the way um, that the translation carries these words better captures the heart of the text and better captures how it's applicable in our modern society. So, Ephesians 5.22. For wives, and every wife loves this verse. But look at, look at how um, it's handled, how Mr. Simmons handles it. For wives, this means being supportive to your husbands like you are already, I'm throwing that in there for clarity, Tenderly devoted to our Lord. So the, the word that's in every other English translation is the word wives submit to your husbands. And submit is an incredibly popular word in our culture. <laughs> and sadly, the word submit and submission has undergone definition transformations in the last 200 years. If you were to back up to Noah Webster's dictionary back in the late 1800s, you would see several meanings for the word submission that have been dropped from our dictionaries today. And one of those is to yield. And the truth is that often we don't make progress in any kind of conflict until somebody yields. And so I like, the funny thing is, and I'm, I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, 
But in the Greek, the word submit is not in that verse. It's pulled from the verse before. So this is why I like Simmons' use of the word devotion. Okay, let me read through the whole text, and then we'll start applying it, okay? So try not to panic. And I know some of you are already panicking. Oh, no, she'll never listen to me now, some of you guys are thinking. And I just want you to know she's not listening to you anyway, so... <laughs> But you're not listening to her either, so it's kind of even, right? I'm cutting up. Don't get mad. <laughs> you don't have to agree with me. You don't even have to like me. Okay, let's get to a vision. For wives, this means being supportive to your husbands like you're tenderly devoted to our Lord. For the husband provides leadership for the wife, just as Christ provides leadership for his church as the Savior and reviver of the body. I love how Mr. Simmons uses the word reviver. In the same way the church is devoted to Christ, let the wives be devoted to their husbands and everything. And to the husbands, you are to demonstrate love for your wives with the same tender devotion that Christ demonstrated to us, his bride. For he died for us by sacrificing himself to make us holy and pure, cleansing us through the showering of the pure water of the word of God. All that he does in us is designed to make us a mature church for his pleasure until we become a source of praise to him, glorious and radiant, beautiful and holy, without fault or flaw. Husbands have the obligation of loving and caring for their wives the same way they love and care for their own bodies. For to love your wife is to love your own self. No one abuses his own body but pampers it, serving and satisfying its needs. That's exactly, that's exactly what Christ does for his church. He serves and satisfies us as members of his body. For this reason, a man is to leave his father and his mother and lovingly hold to his wife, since the two have become joined as one flesh. Marriage is the beautiful design of the Almighty, a great and sacred mystery meant to be a vivid example of Christ and his church. So every married man should be gracious to his wife, just as he is gracious to himself. And every wife should be tenderly devoted to her husband. I think that's beautiful. I think it's a beautiful rendition of a passage that we're probably pretty familiar with. The God who ordained marriage created sex. It was his idea. He created it, okay? And so I want you to know that when, when we talk about the intimacy of a marriage, you're talking about a God who, who made sure that it would have intimacy in it, that, that in having intimacy in a marriage, he wasn't just saying... Um, Here's this thing that's fun and enjoyable. He was saying, there's something so deep in this relationship that perfectly mirrors the depth of the relationship that I want with you. Does that make sense? So intimacy is, uh, I love how I heard it said long ago, you probably heard this. Intimacy is into me you see. So God creates this beautiful thing of intimacy. And then God says, this is too precious and too dear to treat casually. So I'm going to protect it with a covenant. I'm going to wrap it in a covenant that says, I covenant with you that as we grow in our relationship, that no matter what I find, I'll stay. How can you have intimacy if you don't know your partner's going to stay? Well, here's the answer. You can't have intimacy if you don't know your partner's going to stay. You can have sex, but you can't have intimacy. You can write that down. God wants you to have real intimacy, and that's what I want for every marriage in the house. I, um, I've said this before in a lot brash, more brash ways, but I, I want you to enjoy your marriage. I want you to enjoy your life together. Yes, there are hard moments, but I also believe that some of the most rewarding and, 
and precious moments come out of those moments of intimacy. It, it's the hard stuff that builds a marriage. Every, every major breakthrough we've ever had in our marriage, from personal experience, every major breakthrough came just on the other side of the worst fight. Most uh, marriage counseling, whether Christian or not, most of it and most of what you see on TV, most of the books you're going to read, when it talks about marriage, it says something to the effect of communication is key. And I disagree. I, I do. I, I disagree. John Gottman is not a Christian, but he is a, a clinical marriage counselor, a uh, clinical psychologist who's a marriage, marriage counselor, and he's done studies for decades on marriage. And he says that 69% of all marital conflict is perpetual, meaning you'll still be fighting about it in five years. And I know you're all really encouraged. You're like, oh, well, think about it. I mean, if, if and, and he's, he's got the science to back this up. This isn't just Michael pulled a number out of the sky. But just think about it. You guys who've had some experience with marriage, think over the last five years, are you still fighting about the same things? So that's why I don't think communication is the key. I think it's a starting point. I think you, you have to learn to actually and truthfully communicate in any relationship. But I think that's the rub. I think a lot of marriages are communicating just fine and very loudly, and the neighbors know what's going on. <laughs> What I have seen over the years is couples tend to communicate about not the problem. That's what I call it. Um, and so most couple, couples talk about not the problem, and then they yell about not the problem, and then they pretend like they have resolved not the problem until the pressure builds up again, and they fight about not the problem again. And so if you actually want communication to help you, you have to get past not the problem and actually talk about the problem. What's the problem? Usually the problem is actually kind of simple. It's usually someone feels disrespected or someone feels neglected. It's usually one of those two sides. Now, I know it's not that simple, but in a sense, it's, it's kind of one of those two pathways. Someone feels disrespected, someone else feels neglected. And so... Communication, if it actually were to communicate when I'm, I'm experiencing you in a way that is disrespectful, um, I, I love how um, the Egger, uh, Egger Rich book writes it. It says, what you just said felt disrespectful. Have I done something unloving? Or what you said felt unloving. Have I done something disrespectful? I think that's a great, great line. But the, the real issue is, is that I don't think communication is the answer. I think truth is the answer. Champion your spouse. Ephesians 5, 22, verse 25, verse 22 and 25. Listen to this. Wives, this means be supportive to your husbands like you're tenderly devoted to the Lord. And to the husbands, you are to demonstrate love for your wives with the same tender devotion that Christ demonstrated to us. Uh, Mr. Simmons, who did the Passion Translation, uses this word devotion, and he's painting this picture of a husband and a wife that are in a unified relationship. They're two complete people, and this is key. America has this romantic, foolish notion that codependent people should get together and complete each other. You complete me. I will smack you, but I will not complete you. That's unhealthy. That's codependency, okay? That's not good. But what God does is God takes two ones and turns them into a one that's greater than the sum of two ones. And so I just want you to realize that as we, that our devotion to each other, our love for each other, I mean, duty and responsibility and a, and a covenant can keep you together in the bad times, but you got to understand that the goal is not, we're going to stay married. The goal is, I adore you. I need you. Not to complete me, but because we're one. That together we could do so much more than any two ones could ever do.
1 Corinthians 14 talks about prophecy building up the church. And what I think Christians' relationships need to learn to do is to see what God sees and say what God says in their marriage. Biblically, that's what prophecy is. It's seeing what God sees and saying what God says. What am I trying to say here? The enemy gets in your head, shuts off all the lights, and starts feeding poison into the echo chamber of your brain about your marriage. And now all of a sudden, your spouse can do nothing right. And you see everything that's wrong, and you start reading in all these things that are poisonous to that relationship. So what has to happen is that light has to get turned back on. And I have to stop listening to the deceiver and the liar. And I have to start seeing what God sees. And God is light. And God is love. That is his isness. <laughs> I know you're like, that's his business? No, that's his isness. He's love and he's light. And so when I begin to look at my wife and I begin to see the potential of the Father on her, I see a warrior. I see someone who will fight for what's right to the last breath. And, and I see someone who will stand up for, for love, for life, for God, for truth. I'm not just staring at a, at a homemaker or a, a, a client services director at work. I'm staring at one of the king's daughters. And she needs to hear that. She needs to hear things like, hey, it's okay to have a bad day. Just don't forget who you are. Bad days do not define your identity as a dearly loved daughter of the king. It's okay to be sad and to struggle and to worry and to all the things that she carries as a mother. But you also need to know that the worries of today and the shadows of the moment do not define who you are. And she needs me. That, I, God put me in her life to tell her that kind of stuff. And guess what? God put her in my life to tell me that kind of stuff too. Because there are days I want to quit. I don't want to do it anymore. I get tired of it. I get whiny, suck my thumb, want to sit in the corner, cry, eat worms. You're laughing. I'm telling you about yesterday. <laughs> and she's the one who shines light, and she sees what God sees and says what God says for me. What if your marriage did that? What if your marriage, instead of each day going, man, they better get it right today. Supper better be ready when I get home. Uh, he, he better do what I want. Valentine's Day's coming up. I better get a teddy bear. <laughs> Not most women don't want a teddy bear anymore. <laughs> They want someone else to do dishes, cook dinner, and get a nap. I mean, uh, just kidding. Just kidding. We, what if you gave each other courage? This is the new covenant. This is seeing what God sees, saying what God says, and beginning to see for each other the things that they cannot see for themselves. Because sometimes when you're in a dark place, you can't see anything good. And most of the time in a marriage, you're, you have bad days on different days. And so the job is to, to lift each other up. And I hope if you guys who aren't married or you are maybe thinking about it, I hope you'll remember what I've said. And remember that going into, if you go into a relationship, have a vision of it being awesome. Have a vision of it being awesome. The world looks at marriage like, oh, you gotta, it's the hardest thing ever. It just sucks the life out of you. You gotta have all the resources, blah, 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 blah. That is not how marriage is in God's economy. It's not how it's in the kingdom. Marriage in the kingdom is life. It gives life, it encourages life, it protects us, it heals us, it nurtures us. Get a vision for your marriage like that. Because if you can, because right now, most people, their marriage is like, okay, we're just going to stay married. If we can just stay married. If you just stay married, that will stink. 
So aim a little higher. If we could just be devoted to each other. If we could just enjoy each other. Have great physical intimacy. I want to read you something. These are the vows I wrote based on Ephesians 5. I choose you. I give myself to this covenant of marriage, and I thank God for sending you. My heart will always be for you. I will always care for you with patience, kindness, and humility. I will celebrate your joys and share your pain. I will encourage your dreams and comfort your losses. I will never lose faith in you, never lose hope in us, and never give up on our future together. No matter life's path from this day forward, I will remain with you. I just wanted to submit those to you because sometimes we need to look each other in the eye and tell each other how much we mean to each other. And I thought it might help. Father, thanks for letting me share that. In Jesus' name, amen.